Welcome to Argumentative Indians, okay. a platform committed to the dissemination of knowledge through debates and discussions on issues that matter. I would like to inform the audience that the session is also being streamed live on YouTube. So, ignorance is an evil weed which dictators may cultivate among their dupes, but which no democracy can afford among its citizens. This befitting statement made by British economist William Beveridge makes a point for not only how Hitler could propagate Nazi ideology, but also for America's nuclear blunder in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Historically, humans have been obstinately ignorant, evident from the ostracization and even execution of anyone who contradicted the ancient belief that the world was flat. Well, some are even ignorant now. The influence of the media, corporations, and governmental agencies, secrecy, and suppression of information consequently become tools for articulated ignorance that authoritarian regimes, and sometimes unfortunately even democratic ones, use to their benefit, especially for electoral campaigning, by tapping into the voters' ignorant minds. Well, ignorance on the battlefield and in military operations treads a Byzantine path where the balance in the dissemination of information, both to the enemy and their own soldiers, becomes crucial. One might be ignorant enough to think that ignorance in politics and war does not affect them directly, failing to comprehend how nations poses serious practical and political difficulties. Asking questions like, what don't we know? Why don't we know it? And how do we come to know it? Produce a knowledgeable and aware citizenry capable of rising above the error of ignorance fallacy. Therefore, we at Argumentative Indians dip into this emerging discipline of ignorance studies that Robert Proctor called agnotology, but from a historian's perspective, because history has seen a lamentable number of blunders as a consequence of ignorance, both willful and unintended. I am your host, Doreen Bora, and today we have with us Professor Peter Berg, who is a historian and professor emeritus of cultural history at the University of Cambridge, well known for his work on the modern age and research on social and cultural history. He has multiple books to his name, including A Social History of Knowledge, Popular Culture in Early Modern Europe, and A Social History of the Media, and many more. Welcome to Argumentative Indian, sir. It is a pleasure to have you with us. So, sir, we have all heard the maxim that ignorance is a bliss. We don't need to worry about what we don't know. But with the state of the world in the present, is it really possible to be ignorant, especially in politics and warfare? Thank you, Dory. And good evening, everybody, wherever you are. So today's talk is based on the book that I finished quite recently, A History of Ignorance, and it will be published next January. Now, you may think that ignorance is a very strange subject for a historian to tackle. If ignorance is an absence of knowledge, how on earth can you find sources to write the history of an absence? That, that challenge was some, something that made me all the more interested in writing such a book. But I need to explain very quickly how I came to this. That is, that in the last generation, I think one of the most striking new approaches to history, alongside the history of the environment, of course, is the history of knowledge. Or as Americans prefer to call it, the history of information. It's an, that that um, difference in vocabulary um, reveals the difference of approach as well. Now, when studying any topic, I, I found it very in, extremely illuminating to turn it upside down and look at the complementary opposite. Historians of memory discovered forgetting. 
historians of language discovered silence. And a few of us historians of knowledge are in the process of discovering the history of ignorance. Following the lead, I should say, of sociologists, anthropologists, economists, historians came a little bit late to this particular problem. But in any case, as they began work, they distinguished varieties of ignorance. It can be deliberate as well as unconscious. It can be genuine and it can be feigned. Um, and there are many distinctions like this. And again, this group of historians is exploring the open frontiers between ignorance and uncertainty, ignorance and secrecy. And some scholars, myself included, we focus on what I like to call a social history of ignorance, which means who exactly does not know what? And indeed, also, who keeps whom ignorant of what? Which maybe is an even more important topic. And of course, the consequences of ignorance that you mentioned earlier, which as we shall see in a moment, are often catastrophic. So today I decided to talk about ignorance in war and politics. And I chose war, not because I'm a specialist in military history, I'm not, but I think the consequences of ignorance are revealed with um, particular speed on the field of battle. And ignorance is punished uh, rapidly and severely in this situation. So in war, whose ignorance are we speaking about? In the first place, the ignorance of the generals, but in the second place, the ignorance of ordinary soldiers who are often kept in the dark, not only about the aims of the campaign, but about the strategy, the tactics. And in the case of politics, the topic includes both the interest, the ignorance of ordinary people, and the ignorance of rulers, a topic which became extremely topical when I started work on this book in the age of President um, Trump and, and his follower, President Bolsonaro, who are, have shown themselves remarkably ignorant of things that rulers need to know. But I want to emphasize, besides these two kinds of well-known ignorance at the top and at the bottom. There's a third kind, which has been explored by in business studies, but not, as far as I know, very much outside. And that is organizational ignorance. The point is, in the business studies, it was discovered that large companies organized in hierarchical fashion in such companies much essential information fails to be communicated, both upwards and downwards. The management does not pass much information to the workers. And the workers, who often know many things that the bosses don't know, which you can see on the shop floor, which you can't see from an office upstairs, and they don't pass the information upwards. So in this way, you can say ignorance is built into the system. Now, unlike business, governments and armies have not been studied, as far as I know, in this way. I want to try to do it in this book. It's rather rash to come as an outsider and do this. But of course, somebody has to start. And then um, in the course of people criticizing me, maybe more interesting research will take place. So now I begin with war. So armies suffer from organizational ignorance. The soldiers on the ground always know things of which their commanders are ignorant, but also vice versa. The commanders have the big picture, but the soldiers have the local knowledge. An extreme form um, which did lead to disaster was when Hitler invaded Russia in 1941. 
because he insisted on taking charge of the campaign, but he never went to Russia. He tried to lead from the back, sitting in Germany and not allowing the generals on the spot to do what they thought the circumstances required. And of course, that made disaster predictable. Now, understandably, commanders keep the ordinary soldiers ignorant of their plans, because the more people that know the plans, the more likely the enemy will discover the next move. Um, so the problem is that when people don't have information and they'd like to have information, rumor flourishes. It's a natural human response. So as a result, then, rumors circulate among the troops. And the great French historian, Marc Bloch, he served in the First World War. And immediately afterwards, he wrote an article about the rumors that circulated in the trenches, which were very often totally wrong. And interesting, he may be the first scholar to use the now fashionable term fake news because in 1921, he called his article Les Fausses Nouvelles de la Guerre, which translates exactly the false news of the war. Now, turning to the generals, it's obvious that commanders don't know, but desperately want to guess the plans of the enemy. Described by the Duke of Wellington as, you have to know what's happening on the other side of the hill. Or as Napoleon, Wellington's great adversary, remarked, I quote, a general never knows anything with certainty, never sees his enemy clearly, never knows positively where he is. And for this reason, military theorists, starting with the great von Clausewitz, have spoken of the fog of war, and in particular, the fog of battle, both literal, as in the case of the Battle of Austerlitz, and metaphorical. But the main point I want to make here is that we should look at ignorance as relative. That is, um, all commanders are ignorant to some extent, but some are less ignorant than others about the situation they find themselves in. So, um, the the relatively ignorant one is the one that's defeated. A classic case, very well studied, is that of the generals in the Franco-Prussian War of 1870. Now, ironically, it was the French who knew less about the terrain in which they were fighting, which was France. Uh, it was the border country very near um, Germany. Now, the Prussians remember to bring maps with them, but the French, overconfident, had only brought maps of Germany. They thought they were going to invade, they were going to win quickly. So they end up fighting a war in their own country, and they don't know where they are. They've never heard of these villages. And a fatal combination in warfare is when you join ignorance to arrogance. Now, this is sometimes the case of professional soldiers despising the amateurs, the guerrilla forces. They underestimate the enemy, and that means they're liable to be taken by surprise because the enemy is actually knows the job better than the generals on the other side think. And arrogance is sometimes contempt an enemy that also looks different, has a different skin color, and that too will lead to um, catastrophe. Both cases of um, prejudice based on ignorance, professional and racial prejudice, became very clear in the Vietnam War, and they led directly to the American defeat, as indeed ex-Secretary of State Robert McNamara admitted himself years later. Not at the time, it would have been too embarrassing, but 20 years after, he says, this is why we lost the war. 
Now, as a historian, what interests me particularly professionally are cases where ignorance of the past leads to defeats in the present. And I'll take a notorious case or three cases together, the three invasions of Afghanistan, first by the British, second by the Russians, and thirdly by the Americans. Now, the first invasion took place in 1839 and is most memorable today for the disastrous retreat of the British army from Kabul in 1842. The force was virtually annihilated. The British leaders, commanders, did not realize how easy it would be for the Afghans to lay an ambush for the army when it retreated as it had to through the narrow mountain passes. There wasn't another way out of Afghanistan, and so, of course, the Afghans were waiting for them. And another mistake made at the time was the decision to retreat during the winter. And they were warned against it, that this is where arrogance comes in, that the locals who, who knew about the climate said, don't wait, wait till the spring before you go. And the, the army didn't have winter clothing. This was just like the retreat from Moscow in 1812. Uh, the, Napoleon, of course, was aware that there was a harsh Russian winter, but he was confident that he could leave Moscow in time, and he miscalculated, and there were no winter clothes. And so what happened to the British army in 1842 was like what happened to the French army in 1812. And finally, the British were ignorant of the fact of the Afghan firearms, the Jezels, had a longer range than the British firearms, the muskets. That meant that the Afghans could fire down on the British army from the tops of the cliffs, and they were secure in the knowledge that the British did not have the range to shoot back, or if they shot back, the bullets wouldn't reach them. Now, when the Russians invaded Afghanistan, almost exactly 140 years later, 1979, they made some of the same mistakes. Actually, they were warned. The British Foreign Office presented a visiting Russian minister with a history of the British expedition of 1839. I don't know whether the minister said thank you, but we know that he said confidently, this time it will be different, but it wasn't. The guerrillas, the Mujahideen, ambushed the Russians in the same way, took their weapons. They would man the heights, overlooking the slow-moving Soviet column. They would knock out the first vehicle and the last vehicle with a mine or a rocket. And then everybody was trapped and they could be systematically destroyed, no hurry. They, they couldn't go anywhere. And then in 2001, it was the turn of the Americans to invade and yet again make some of the same mistakes. And basically, the Americans, like their predecessors, did not take the defenders seriously enough, forgetting as in the case of the Russian forces in Ukraine today, that conscript soldiers with no interest in a war are unlikely to be a match for volunteers defending their families, defending their native soil. So the motivation of fighting is so much stronger on one side than the other. So basically, I, I believe uh, that in the Russian and American cases, the invaders failed to learn from history. And as the philosopher George Santayana once remarked, those who do not remember the past are condemned to repeat it. Let me now turn to a more complex subject of ignorance in politics. And, and to begin again with organizational Rulers often believe that, as Louis XIV of France wrote in his memoirs, that they are informed about everything. 
but they are not. Subordinates are understandably unwilling to tell their superiors what they believe those superiors do not want to know. They filter the information. This keeps them out of trouble in the short term, but it often causes disasters in the long term. It hides problems. It gives rulers unjustified confidence. Nobody dared tell Hitler that the many divisions he had in Russia um, were really only a fraction of the number that they were on paper. Hitler moved his flags about on the map thinking that the divisions had hundreds of thousands of people and they sometimes had only 10% of that. Now the problem of lack of information at the top is particularly acute in the case of empires, especially new empires, since conquerors generally know little about the people or the resources of the country they have only just conquered. And then when they send in the administrators, these administrators do not always bother to learn the local languages. And in any case, even if they can speak to ordinary people, it's not in the interest of those people to give accurate information to the conquerors. I call this imperial ignorance. And since it's obvious enough in the history of India from the Mughals onwards, I don't feel I need say any more about it here. I leave that up to you. So I turn now to the ignorance of the ruled, the ignorance of ordinary citizens. And I think we can sum up the situation in a simple statement. Ignorance is an asset for authoritarian regimes and it's an anxiety for democracies. I take these in turn. In his famous report on Iran under the Shah, published in 1880, in 1982, three years after the Shah had fallen, the famous Polish journalist, Richard Kapuscinski, wrote, I quote, a dictatorship depends for its existence on the ignorance of the people. That's why all dictators take so much trouble to cultivate that ignorance. And rulers themselves have sometimes admitted that they needed to keep the people in the state of ignorance. In 17th century France, Cardinal Richelieu, who governed the country in the name of the king, and he wrote his memoirs, and he wrote, educating the peasants was quite undesirable. In the first place, it would ruin agriculture, and in the second place, make it difficult to recruit soldiers. So he preferred that French peasants did not learn even to read and write. But although keeping the people ignorant solves some problems for autocrats, it creates others. Once again, as in the case of war, the lack of information available to ordinary people is filled by rumor, which flourishes every time the demand for news exceeds the supply. A good example of this in practice, Stalin's Russia. Um, people did not believe what was printed in the official newspapers, Pravda and Izvestia. So for once, um, rumor was a relatively reliable source of information. And that was how people tried to find out what was going on. Naturally, this ha happens, I think, everywhere where rumors circulate, conspiracy theories flourish. Now, if the ignorance of the ruled is cultivated by autocrats, as I said, it's a source of anxiety in democratic regimes. Remember the argument of Thomas Jefferson, I quote, if a nation expects to be ignorant and free in the state of civilization, it expects what never was and never will be. 
oppositions to extension of the franchise, oppositions to democracy, have often relied on the argument that ex-slaves or women or the working class are too ignorant to use their vote wisely. This was the argument used in Britain in the early 19th century against the extension of the franchise. It was rejected by the minority of radicals in the country and in parliament. They argued instead in favor of national education. And they accused the government, I quote, of fostering and perpetuating ignorance among the people. Now, the right to vote was extended to the skilled working class in Britain in 1867. That's a generation after this debate about education. And in, I, I believe it's extremely significant that the extension in 1867 was followed by an Education Act in 1870, making elementary education universal compulsory. This was no coincidence, as one British politician remarked rather wryly, we must educate our masters. <clears throat> Elsewhere in Europe, the old regime often lasted longer, and where democracy was installed in theory, there were countries in which it was little more than a facade. There was a famous social survey of Italy carried out after the Second World War. Now, in the case of Sicily, the survey included the question, I quote, what do you think the Italian political parties should do now? And among the answers, which are now in, in the archives, I, I quote the following. Well, how could I know? Another one. We don't take a newspaper. A third one. The government should know. A fourth one. I am a poor, ignorant person. So they just won't answer the question. Today, of course, you don't need newspapers to learn about current affairs. You can watch television, you can read messages on social media. But the problem of citizens' ignorance has not, unfortunately, gone away. Voter ignorance, as the political scientists call it, has been the object of a number of surveys, especially, I think, in the United States, also in Britain, and in other countries, I'm not so sure. But it's rather frightening to discover that um, around a third of American citizens have been classified by the political scientists as politically ignorant, defining this as people who give wrong answers or fail to answer two thirds of the questions about politics in the surveys. And that when you read the questions, they're quite easy questions to think, but still um, you have a third of the citizens not answering them. In the year 2008, for example, 58% of people surveyed did not know that Condoleezza Rice was Secretary of State. 61% did not know that Nancy Pelosi was Speaker of the House of Representatives, as she continued um, until um, a day or two ago. In 2014, only 38% of Americans knew which party controlled each of the two houses in Congress. So elementary questions, ignorance of the answers. And the American public was and is especially ignorant of foreign affairs, I think, more so than the European public. In 1964, only 38% were aware that the USSR was not a member of NATO. That's a rather serious um, thing not to know. In 2007, only 20% could name the Suez 
as the larger of the two major branches of Islam. And needless to say, American voters are not the only ignorant ones, but simply the ones whose ignorance has been revealed through surveys most often. In, in the UK, there was widespread ignorance about the probable effects of Brexit at the time of the crucial referendum. And generally, it's believed that the crime rate in Britain is increasing, but the statistics suggest it's been falling in recent years. And of course, knowledge or lack of knowledge affects the way one's going to vote, so this really matters. But the political consequences of voter ignorance are not limited to ignorance of politics. Ignorance of science may lead voters astray when climate change is being debated at the time of an election. Now, I'd also like to suggest that the idea of voter ignorance sh should be extended a little bit more to include people who rely on suspect information. They rely on what they see or hear because they've not been, they haven't learned to be critical, either of bias in the media or of the possibility of fake news. They're vulnerable to what the Russian Secret Service used to call, maybe still calls, disinformation, disinformatia. And that brings me to what sociologists call the production of ignorance, meaning by this cover-ups, attempts to cover up what governments want the people not to know. In my view, it would be more accurate to describe cover-ups as attempts to maintain ignorance, the ignorance of ordinary people rather than produce it. But the sociologists are certainly right to be investigating these cases. A spectacular case of this kind was the disaster at Chernobyl in 1986 and the efforts of the Gorbachev regime to cover it up. Ironically enough, in the, exactly at the time of what was supposed to be an age of transparency, the age of glasnost. Also, again, think of China's attempt to cover up the massacre of students on Tiananmen Square in 1989. Of course, at the time they couldn't cover it up. Most Chinese knew about it. But since then, it's become a taboo topic. You can't, you mustn't mention it. You can't even mention the date on which it occurred because the government thinks that that will be a secret way of referring to it. So as a result, many young Chinese apparently know nothing at all about this incident. An incident. And in that case, it is really the case that their parents didn't dare tell them. That would be a case of ignorance which had really been produced by the government. So I conclude, ignorance is a major danger to democracy, but maybe an even greater danger is credulity, by which I mean this lack of the ability to assess the reliability of messages. I mean, we need constantly to ask ourselves, who's telling us this? What's their agenda? Um, and of course, we need to have recourse to fact-checking apps before we pass on uh, uncritically whatever we heard in the news or from the neighbors or whatever. And so I think if there's a remedy to the situation, it lies in schools and, and indeed in elementary schools for them, where the children are still quite young. They need or already to have lessons in this kind of what historians call source criticism. I think this is essential if democracy is to survive. So thank you for your attention and I await uh, with expectancy what people will comment on all this. Uh, sir, so with reference to what you talked about the media, 
uh, what is the role uh, played by media in adding to the ignorant minds of people? Because we know Hitler successfully did it. Successfully did it. And but with the coming of the internet, especially social media in the so-called information so age, information how age. has the access has to the access unlimited to information unlimited affected, affected ignorance? ignorance? Was it not supposed to reduce the ignorance? Reduce but how is it actually fueling it? Fueling it. Yes, so the media have a double role because the, the media are um, often biased. I mean, um, if you turn on different news programs when they're broadcasting uh, um, information about exactly the same events, let's say Fox News is on one side and the local academic news channel in a particular state of the United States, the, the contrast is so, so great. So, we have to take it for granted that um, when news comes through um, television or radio or the newspapers, it's biased. Um, it's good to take to go to two sources. Um, personally, I'm, I'm a guardian leader, which means I'm on the liberal left in the UK. But every week I take the Economist, which is more right wing, because I don't simply want the newspapers to reinforce my prejudices, but occasionally to at least challenge them. And then, um, what are the what counts as media? I count as media to ordinary conversation and it's oral transmission of the news and ideas about it. And of course, that is maybe the most dangerous of all. You know, I catch myself um, when I retell stories. Um, they become more dramatic. I, I don't do this deliberately, but you know, when you've told the same anecdote about yourself, let's say 10 times, it's become um, inaccurate. And that people are doing this all the time without meaning to, but leaving aside the possibility that sometimes the neighbors want to tell you uh, definite lies. Um, they want, they prefer you, you to vote another way, so they tell you something bad about um, the person they think you want to vote for. So we, we have to face this. But the only way to save us from the media are the media. Um, um, because I'm using the term to refer to all kinds of communication. So um, when a teacher uh, addresses the class in school, and um, this is the oral medium of communication, but it can be used then to show the dangers of other oral forms of communication. Um, it's maybe um, not uh, the answer we would like, but I think we have to live with it. The only people that can rescue us from the media are, are the media, um, amateurs in the media as well as professionals. Mm -hmm. No, so, uh, so uh, sir, actually, sir, actually, uh, right. So, about uh, so you were talking about, about the cover ups the that, cover -ups uh, that, that uh, governments do about their past, especially we know that British history school books they do not find mention of the past colonial injustices that were done by the British Empire. Is it because it is convenient for them to ignore them by covering the past blunders and uh, making their upcoming generations ignorant or ignore the past blunders that they have done? So what is your take on this? I think there's a very um, great contrast between the interest in the colonial situation among the colonized and the interest among the colonizers. So um, the British are forgetting all about this. Um, and, and I understand that in India, Africa, and elsewhere, of course, few people can't forget because they, they were the victims of colonialism. And so um, the debate takes very different forms, including among and professional historians as well, this debate about the past. 
So, um, but maybe you want to make a more um, precise point, which I missed. Um, so, so your so voice is actually breaking. You know, you kind of like the situation about victory and defeat. That is, the winners often forget what happened, and the defeated never forget. And the contrast between um, knowledge of Irish history in England and in Ireland uh, is enormous. Um, but if, if your side has committed massacres, then um, you, you don't want to remember this. But of course, the the people um, who had relatives and friends who were massacred will never forget. Uh, yes, um, I think it's more to do. So, so we, uh, right now, we talked about how the government is actually uh, making their past mistakes cover up, like we're covering them up. But why do political leaders choose to ignore historical precedents and warnings, like you talked about, the failure of the Soviet Union to control Afghanistan in 1979. But that did not deter the Americans to commit the same mistake. They ended up doing the same blunder in 2001. And the Mujahideen uh, support backfired them in the form of 9-11. So why do the leaders actually try to ignore these past warnings or past precedents? Yeah. Sorry, I'm not quite sure what the question was. Could you sum it up in one sentence? Yes, sir. So I'm saying, uh, why do political leaders ignore historical uh, history, like why do they ignore history and commit the same mistakes? Like you said, the Russians made the same mistake in Afghanistan as the British did. So your, so your mic is on mute. Can you unmute it? Yes, sir. Please continue yes, sir. now. Please continue now. Many political leaders uh, stopped learning history when they left school. Um, maybe they didn't even like the subject. They made their careers. Um, if you want to be a leading politician, it's better to be trained in law, or dare I say, even become an actor rather than study history. Um, there, are, there are very few cases of um, people who um, made an advanced study of history and become a head of a government. So um, they're aware that there is all that past out there. Uh, I, they haven't got time um, to learn about it. It's too late because once you're in power, there's some situations is occurring every day. Um, so um, there's really no time for that sort of reflection. You could, of course, surround yourself with people to advise you and, and to give you information. And among those, it would be perfectly possible to have a historian or two, but they don't think of it, generally speaking. Um, I've, I've met a couple of historians who have been asked to advise them, somebody in the British government, usually a minister rather than the prime minister. Um, so I, I, I'm not surprised that politicians don't know much about the past. Only uh, on occasion, it, that ignorance of the past has very serious consequences. Um, I think a whole set of examples 
from um, 1919 when Wood Robinson and Lloyd George uh, had to redraw the map of Europe, but they didn't actually know a lot about Europe. And um, therefore they, they, um, they would mark some line for the frontier to go and they wouldn't know what the language people were speaking on each side. So, um, what, what, for example, an area that the Austrians call the Tyrol and the Italians call the Alto Adige, and it was composed of a mixture of people identifying themselves in different ways and speaking different languages. But none of this was known um, to the people sitting at Versailles who had the power to make um, what they wrote down and affect people's lives for um, ever since that day. So, yeah. so we will take one more question. Is that there is a trend of hyper-nationalism and neo-fascism around the world that is clearly evident in the US and even in India. So how is ignorance helping fuel this hyper-nationalism, this trend of hyper-nationalism? So please unmute yourself. Yes, and that's a puzzle to me in the sense that there was a, what we call an age of nationalism in the early 19th century, not only in Europe, but in the Americas. Um, late 18th and early 19th. And after that, I had the idea that that was all done, but that was clearly um, much too Eurocentric a view. And so places that were not so nationalist at that period are nationalist now. And um, I'm sure that, um, it would be worth asking psychologists the question why there should be a, a, an apparently greater and greater need, which includes many ordinary people and not just the politicians, than for seeing the country in a uniform way. Of it, it all ought to be people like us. Um, so I think in, in, in India, um, the uh, Hindu, the, Hindus not wanting a country with Muslims in it. And it's rather like in, well, um, in, in Britain today, there are still this hardcore of people who think that anybody that speaks a foreign language should go back, they say, where they came from. Um, and of course, there's the ironic situation in the UK today, two successive home secretaries who come from families of immigrants are doing their very best to stop any more immigrants coming. Um, so that's, um, I find it always puzzling. Um, I suppose that's partly for personal reasons. All my gra four grandparents were migrants to Britain. So I don't think myself as, um, as all that different from the people who are wanting to come. Um, so why is it the places that were a generation ago relatively tolerant, I'm thinking of um, the Netherlands as well as Britain and the Scandinavia, why now they have minorities of people vociferously um, and denouncing the takeover of the country by immigrants, and it means simply another 30, 40,000 in the population, 65 million. And I think it's got something to do with speed of immigration, the scale of immigration. But maybe it's natural for people to feel swamped, although when you look at the figures, they aren't actually swamped. And I think that's got something to do with it. But that would work for Western European countries. But in India, I, I, I don't think this explanation works. And therefore, all I could say is I don't understand it. And maybe you have a, a good explanation. <laughs> so 
I mean, that is a mystery to everyone, actually. But sir, uh, apart from all the bad or the negative side that we have seen so far, can ignorance even have a positive side? Can there be a good ignorance? Like uh, some people have called uh, it to be. Can there be a revolutionary power or in ignorance? So what is your thought about that? A good sort of ignorance. So your uh, so your voice, uh, mic is on mute. No, it, nothing came on the screen this time for me. Yes, sir, I will uh, look to it just a minute. I'm asking, is there a good side, a good side to ignorance? Yes, there, there are. So your mic again went on mute. Mute, so yes. So please unmute your mic, sir. Yes, sir. In the case of trials, I think it's very good that the jury should not have access to the newspapers so that they are not influenced by the media um, and only have the information that's provided with them in court. And again, I think that examiners uh, um, ought to be ignorant of the identity of the people that they're examining. So um, there was a, a set of concrete situations like that where um, ignorance is bet better than knowledge. Um, but on a more general scale, um, I don't think um, that in most situations, ignorance is a good idea. So we were moving towards the conclusion and we would love to hear what you will say about ignorance. Like, uh, what has been your idea in the book? So your uh, mic again, it is on mute. Yes, sir. Yes. Yes, yes sorry, but when I had to keep fiddling with this mute and unmute, um, I, didn't, I don't catch everything that you're saying. The box at the bottom keeps going away. Yeah. So, sorry, so could you repeat that one? Yes, sir. Uh, I was asking uh, I was about asking what is about what are your what concluding your thoughts, thoughts on thoughts ignorance in politics, politics and war? Sorry, I missed it again. Yeah. Yes, sir, just a minute. I'm typing it. So are you able to read my messages, sir? Yeah, um, yeah, I um, can't think of a conclusion different from that I already put forward, really. Right. Um, so what, what we so can gather what, from what can gather this from discussion this is that discussion ignorance is, that is ignorance becoming is a real problem because of the fact that there is a discipline that has emerged called called agnotology, which was termed actually uh, coined by Ian Boyle, Boyle and uh, Robert Proctor. And we cannot remain ignorant in this state of affairs in the world, as Professor Burke has actually pointed out throughout this discussion. And uh, we will uh, also thank Professor Burke for joining on with, in with us today. And uh, we will move towards the conclusion of the session. You can watch the session on YouTube. And uh, Professor Burke, thank you so much for joining in with us. Uh, we will conclude the session, sir. Well, thank you so much for inviting me.